Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our virtual Asian carp information session. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. My name is Rebecca Schroeder, and I manage our Asian Carp Canada program at the Invasive Species Centre, and I will be your moderator this evening. This event was also co-organized with the Friends of the Pinery. The Invasive Species Centre is located in Sault Ste. Marie in the Robinson Huron Treaty Territory, and the land where we work is traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Metis people. As we meet virtually today, our speakers are joining us from all around the Great Lakes, and we acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, and we give thanks for this land and water, and we want to express our gratitude to the nations who have been its stewards. Um, before we get started, I would like to pass things over to Becky Cudmore just to give a brief introduction. Yeah, hi everybody. I'm wearing a couple hats tonight. And so with my Friends of the Pinery Park hat, uh, I just wanted to uh, welcome all participants on behalf of the charitable organization, Friends of Pinery Park, uh, including the executive director, Gail Jeffrey, the board of directors and its members. So thanks very much to the Invasive Species Center for organizing this for us and for the opportunity for uh, our community to ask questions about grass carp. I just wanted to remind everybody, if you wanted to check out um, how to be a member of Friends of the Pinery, uh, there's a lot of great projects, a lot of great benefits to being a member um, and things for you to get involved in. So check out the website as well as the online nature store um, and um, really appreciate everybody taking the time to connect with us tonight. So thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. Um, so just to kick things off, I'd like to do a, a quick poll um, just to see what what we kind of are working with here in terms of knowledge. So let's see um, if everyone can just take a quick second to answer. Looks like we're mostly in the middle um, to begin it, which is good. Awesome, okay. Thank you, everyone. So yeah, this is kind of uh, the results. Great. Okay, so as I mentioned, I work for the Invasive Species Center, which is a nonprofit organization that connects stakeholders, knowledge, and technology to prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. We have a lot of great resources on our website. Uh, you can sign up to receive our emails, like our newsletter media scan and some other event invites like tonight. And you can also check out Asian Carp Canada's website where we have a lot of great resources as well and uh, a lot of information on the, the four species of Asian carps. So just a brief overview of, of the information session tonight. We're gonna start off as we are now with this little introduction and then we're gonna get into some interviews with our panel of experts. Following that, we're gonna open up the floor to our audience to ask some questions. And then um, also tomorrow, if you're in the area, um, you can attend our meet and greet with a DFO surveillance crew and check out some of their gear and ask them questions in person. Um, and Becky, I know you wanted to hop on and, and say something about the event tomorrow quickly. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. I just wanted to flag that uh, the Friends of the Pine Reef Park will have a table there, uh, along with some other groups, and there'll be raffle tickets and items from the store. So definitely come by. Um, some neat stuff to see all around. So look forward to meeting you there. Please feel free to come up and introduce yourself to me. Awesome. Thank you. So before we get started, um, just wanted to run through some logistics really quickly. If you have any questions at any time, please type them in the question box. Um, we are going to start off the session with our panel interviews, where I'll be asking our panelists some questions first. Um, but if at any time, even during that, something comes to mind that you'd like to ask, please feel free to type it in and we'll get to it when we open up the floor to, to questions. So if you could, please state who you'd like to direct your question to. If it's a general question, um, we'll figure out who's best suited to answer it. So no worries. We will do our best to get to all the questions tonight, but in the event that we can't, they are recorded and saved. So we can follow up with you by email afterwards to make sure you get the information you're looking for. If there's any media personnel on the line and you'd like to ask a question, uh, we, we welcome that and that would be amazing. But just please identify that you're with the media when asking your question. 
And lastly, there will be a survey following the session that will pop up um, and it'll also appear in your inbox tomorrow when you get your follow-up email. And if you could take some time to fill it out, we would really, really appreciate it. It helps us with future sessions and planning and making sure that we're giving people what they want. So uh, we'd really appreciate it if you could fill that out. Now, let's get started. So I just wanted to highlight some background information on Asian carps because I know that we have a mixed um, kind of feeling of knowledge here. So before we begin, let's kind of go through that. So Asian carps is the collective term used to describe four species of invasive fishes. We have bighead carp, silver carp, grass carp, and black carp. Some people often think it's just one species when it's actually four. Um, but tonight we would like to focus our efforts on grass carp specifically now. All four species were introduced to the southern United States in the 60s and 70s for use as biological control, but grass carp specifically, um, their spread is the result of stocking for aquatic vegetation control. And they're the most immediate threat of these four species to Canadian waters of the Great Lakes. And that's due to recent evidence of natural reproduction in two U.S. tributaries of Lake Erie. Um, just 10 grass carp per hectare would reduce vegetation by up to 50%. They're, they have voracious appetites and they expel most of what they consume back into the water as waste, which could have a lot of negative impacts on water quality. Um, their feeding habit habits by destroying wetlands would have negative impacts to recreational and commercial fishing, beaches and lakefront use, wildlife viewing, um, and more. That's just kind of to scratch the surface of their impacts. So definitely not something that we want to see happening in the Canadian waters of the Great Lakes or in the Great Lakes as a whole. Um, so I'd like to play a quick video just to give you a better idea of what I was just rambling on about. So I'm hoping that this will work for everyone. Um, and you can hear it. Sometimes you might have to, if you have like headphones and you might just have to unplug them, but um, we're going to Give this a shot. This is the fish we have to stop from getting into the Great Lakes. Grass carp, one of four species of Asian carps, are invasive to North America and have established populations in some parts of the United States. Now, the grass carp invasion is on the doorstep of the Great Lakes. I'm David Marson with Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and I'm a senior aquatic biologist. Canada and the United States are already strong partners working to protect the $7 billion Great Lakes fishery, but we need your help. If these fish become established in Canadian waters, they will have serious impacts on the Great Lakes and beyond. Grass carp eat up to 40% of their body weight in vegetation every day, which produces huge amounts of waste. This waste can lead to algae blooms that negatively impact water quality and pose a threat to human health and safety. Their aggressive eating of aquatic vegetation would also have huge impacts on wetlands, which serve as habitat for our native fishes and birds. Our incredibly valuable recreational and commercial fisheries and other outdoor activities, like wildlife viewing, would be negatively affected. Culturally significant plants, like wild rice, are also at risk from grass carp. Small numbers of grass carp have already been captured in the Great Lakes which means we must act now to stop them from establishing. The key is early detection, finding the few fish that are here and removing them before they get the chance to reproduce. To stop these fish, you have to know them. Grass carp are often confused with common carp. So this is a juvenile grass carp, approximately 30 centimeters in length, but they do reach up to a meter and a half in length. And while this guy's under a pound in weight, they do reach up to 90 pounds. Grass carp has a terminal mouth, which means it ends right at the end of its head. Not facing down, not facing up, but just right off the end. This fish does not have any barbels at the side of the mouth. The scales have a darkening on the, the back of the scale, which actually creates kind of a crosshatch pattern on the side of the fish. Now, when most people observe these fish, they're gonna see them from above. And how we distinguish between the common carp and the grass carp is with the common carp, the dorsal fin would start approximately where my thumb is here and run back to here, where it's much shorter with the grass carp. So the grass carp has the short dorsal fin, the common carp has a long one. And that's the easiest way to really tell them apart when they're in the water. Our team takes every report seriously and we act upon it. We have a chance to make a difference here. There's only a few fish out there and we want to get them early and get them out of the system. 
so every set of eyes on the water really helps this effort. Fisheries and Oceans Canada has an Asian carp program with an early detection focus, so we're out there with nets and equipment that are proven to be effective in capturing grass carp. If there's a report of a grass carp from the public, we will seek those fish out and try to remove them. Tips from the public are essential. The more people we have out there, the more eyes on the water, the better the chance we have of finding these fish. To report a grass carp sighting, or to find out more about Asian carps, visit asiancarp.ca. If you see a grass carp, report it. Okay, so let's get started. Um, this is a little overview of our amazing panel that we have joining us tonight. We are joined by Becky Cudmore from Fisheries and Oceans Canada, who's the manager of the Aquatic Invasive Species Program and Asian Carp Program. We are also joined by Dr. Nick Mandrak from the University of Toronto, who's a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences. Brooke Schreier from the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, who's the Aquatic Program Specialist with the Invading Species Awareness Program, and Tim Purdy from Purdy Fisheries, who is a commercial fisherman. So to kick off the interview portion, we're going to start with Becky. And I've got now my other hat on. Yes. <laughs> so my first question for you is, what kind of work is Fisheries and Oceans Canada doing in terms of surveillance in the Great Lakes? Well, you got to see a little bit of that in the video uh, with David Marzen, uh, who's my lead biologist for the field and lab program within the Asian Carp program. You saw a variety of nets, and that's the, the where we really focus our surveillance is um, with traditional gear. And where do we put that traditional gear starts with better understanding the fish and the habitat needs that they have. So for grass carp, we need to understand, uh, you know, what, what does it need to eat to survive? Uh, what kind of river length does it need to reproduce? What kind of habitat does it need for all its life stages? And we can overlay that, uh, those biological needs with uh, the physical habitat characteristics of rivers around the Great Lakes. And so that science information uh, was pulled together, analyzed, and then prioritized. So we had a, a good ranking of high, medium, and low risk rivers around the Great Lakes. And we visit from April to November of every year. We hire a lot of summer students, uh, university students, to come and help us go around the Great Lakes and um, look at at least the medium and high risk rivers. And the high risk rivers are actually visited two or three times in a year. Um, and we try to time that with when we think that we might find grass carp uh, in those rivers as they move for spawning our food. And um, so we use, um, so that's how we, we do our surveillance program. And as I said, it's really focused on traditional gears. Awesome. Um, have there been any Asian carps captured in Canadian waters? Yes, we have had Asian carp captured in Canadian waters. Um, to date, since the program started in 2012, we've had 30 individual grass carp caught in Canadian waters of the Great Lakes. And that's from our partners with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, and now some new names um, who couldn't be here today. But uh, between them and ourselves, uh, we are out looking with traditional gear and, and genetic tools. And so you know, we, we, we've caught some of those carp. We've had anglers catch uh, grass carp and report it into us. And we've had commercial fishermen like Tim Purdy uh, also capture uh, grass carp and turn those into us. So yeah, we've had 30. Um. So my, I guess a follow-up question to that is, what happens when you catch one or when there's a re positive report? Right, that's a great question. Um, yeah, over the years, we've learned a lot about, you know, how important it is to have a plan in place before you catch a grass carp. And so we collaborate uh, with our partners in uh, the provincial government 
to have a, that plan ready to go and a lot of decisions already pre-made. So we know um, that if we catch a carp, we can go on a bit of an, an alert. And uh, the first thing we need to do is set up what's known as the incident command system. And you may even have heard this or kind of understand that from when different countries send their firefighter crews to other countries for forest fires. They all use this incident command system so they know where they fit into the structure. It's very strict, it's very rigid, it's almost military, and um, but it makes everybody, everybody understands where they fit in and who they need to talk to and what job or role that they have. So we go into that incident command system, it's very small, it's usually only about two or three people. And the first thing we need to do is get that fish to our lab in Burlington, Ontario. And um, the fish could be, have been fertile, it could be not fertile. And as you can imagine, a fertile fish is much more concerning to me than, an un, than a, a sterile fish. So the first thing we need to do is to understand um, what we're dealing with, what's the risks. And if it is a fertile fish, then we go to the next level of response or the next level in our incident command, which means we get what we call strike teams out. Um, and I would like to name them after Star Wars fighter jets, but uh, not everybody not everybody agreed with me. I got too many young people working for me. But uh, so, but that's what we kind of do. We just go out, we, we strike hard in the water and we look in, if there's any more in that area. And uh, once we feel like we've really covered that area well um, and we haven't caught any more, we call it off. Great. Um, and then the last question that we have for you for this portion is, what role can Indigenous communities play with respect to this threat? Well, I think Dave said it really well in that video, all eyes on the water um, is, what's gonna, to, is what it's going to take to address this issue. Uh, because the faster that we catch a, a grass carp uh, in Canadian waters, the faster we can remove it and any buddies that he has in the area. Um, and so we really welcome the participation of anybody who's, who's spending time on the water um, to help us look for them, to help us um, identify them and to report them. And we're also really interested in starting up a network um, for these response actions. You know, I feel like everybody could come together who, who love the water, who want to protect the, the Great Lakes ecosystem. And maybe we can come together and, and build from, from the ground up a response network and and so that's going to be a goal in the next little while as uh, as we come out of this uh, global pandemic is to to work with everyone and make sure that we're well prepared ahead of time great well thank you very much becky and we will talk to you again when uh, we open up the floor to the audience okay, so next you. we're gonna um have nick Hello. Hello, Rebecca. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. All right, let's uh, get this started then. So my first question for you, are the Great Lakes suitable for grass carp establishment and why? Well, I think they're, they're, they've been, um, they are highly suitable. Uh, we've done uh, binational risk assessments to evaluate the suitability. Uh, in order to become established, uh, the individuals need to survive and they need to reproduce. And uh, we've shown that uh, that all four species could readily survive uh, in the climate of the Great Lakes Basin. We've done uh, statistical models to show, in fact, that they they could survive in most of uh, northern North America, all the way to Alaska. And this shouldn't really surprise us because when we think of their native distribution in Eastern Asia, that does include Siberia. And in fact, I've caught grass carp in Siberia in lakes that get a, uh, sorry, a meter of ice on them every winter. So they're very much a temperate species, not a tropical species as, as one might assume. Uh, so they could readily survive here, overwinter here, and we've done detailed um, modeling of the potential for them to reproduce in Canadian rivers that are tributary to the Great Lakes and have shown that 
many of the rivers are highly suitable uh, for reproduction. So when you put together the ability to survive uh, in the basin, in the climate of the basin, and the ability to reproduce in these rivers, I have no doubt that if they uh, if, if, if they were to invade the Great Lakes, all of them, they would be able to survive, uh, reproduce, and establish. And I should also point out that there is, depending on the species, there is a lot of food for them. For example, with grass carp, we have a lot of wetlands uh, with uh, aquatic vegetation that would be ideal uh, food for grass carp. That's a meter of ice. That's like, I was gonna, my next question was gonna be something along the lines of would they be it be too cold here, but I guess that's uh, that's not the case. Would Would climate change impact their spread at all? Oh, yes, it would. Uh, so uh, there has been some research on when we would expect um, Asian carps to mature and re start reproducing in the Great Lakes should they get here. And it looks like they would have to be four to five to six years old under the current climate. But from, from the modeling that has been done and from what we see in warmer climates, uh, their age of maturity could go down to two or three years. And what that means is they spend more years reproducing before they eventually die of old age. So uh, climate change would likely increase uh, the population growth rate. That is, we would get to higher numbers of carps sooner after they started reproducing in the Great Lakes Basin. You talked a little bit about um, reproduction and, and spawning suitability. Can you elaborate, I guess, on some of the requirements in these tributaries that would be suitable in Canadian sure. waters? What makes them suitable? And like what is required, I guess, for successful reproduction? Mm -hmm. You know, um, for species that we really don't want to have here, they have a very interesting reproductive biology. They're, they're what are known as broadcast spawners, that is, they lay their eggs on mass and they just let the eggs float down the river. Uh, so they spawn in rivers and they undergo um, a spring to summer uh, migration up rivers. Then they will spawn in parts of the river that are a little more turbulent, for example, at the base of a dam or in a, in a, um, a, uh, a sharp bend in the river where there's a little more flow. Um, the fertilized eggs then need to actually drift down the river until they hatch. And uh, sorry about that. And then they, um, uh, once they hatch, they have to drop into a productive environment like a wetland. So if, if they actually fall out of suspension, that is, they stop floating as they drift down the river and they, they, they fall into the sediment. Uh, most of those eggs will not hatch. So they actually need quite uh, specific requirements. That is, they need a river long enough that allow the eggs to float down it over one or two days and fast, but yet fast enough that the eggs remain uh, buoyant. Uh, then, then where the river slows and the eggs would, would drop as they hatch needs to be productive with wetlands. And these are the very characteristics that we've used in in um, ecological models to determine uh, whether or not any given uh, river in the Great Lakes is, is suitable. And what we, we concluded is basically most rivers in the Great Lakes that are, are at least 15 kilometers long, um, or let's say many of the rivers that are at least 15 kilometers long would be suitable for Asian carp reproduction. Uh, that is a lot shorter than, than we originally thought because when we first thought we were concerned about Asian carps in, in the Great Lakes, all we knew is that in their native range, the rivers needed to be 75 to 100 kilometers long. So we assumed that's how long the rivers needed to be until we actually did under, under um, took these models. And I should point out these models have been validated with actual data in the Sandusky River where grass carp spawn so we know that those you know and, and the eggs can hatch in as few as 15 kilometers of, of 
uh, undammed river. That's very interesting. It's interesting to see how different um, they behave in their, their native range versus their native range. Um, so the last question that I have for you before we open the floor up to the audience questions is, can you give us an overview of some of the control methods that you're currently studying uh, in your lab? Sure. So, you know, probably the easiest way, well, superficially the easiest way to control Asian carps from spawning uh, would be to actually put dams at the mouths of every stream. The, the simplest way to prevent them from getting into the Great Lakes would be to put a physical barrier between Lake Michigan and the upper Mississippi River and the, Sh the Chicago Shipping and Sanitary Canal. However, there, there are other considerations at play, including uh, navigation, including the need for native species to actually migrate into these rivers as well. So uh, dams may, may be the solution in some cases, but not in, in, not, not in all rivers. So we've been looking at uh, other ways to prevent Asian carps from, from accessing areas to spawn in, to feed in. And we call these non-physical barriers. That is um, barriers that do not impede navigation and ideally do not impede the uh, migration of native species. And, and, may, and barriers that we may be able to operate only when we know Asian carps are migrating. And we've done several experiments uh, in the lab, in a, a large enclosure um, within uh, the Great Lakes, and then in the wild at, um, at, at a fishway that has a fish trap. And in each one of these experiments, we're, we are evaluating how um, surrogates for Asian carps, common carp, a, a, a species that is already established here, uh, reacts to these different barriers. And I call them surrogates because, you know, we just don't want, and we use surrogates because we just want, don't want to use Asian carps in Canadian waters. And we have colleagues in the U.S. that do do that where Asian carps are already established. But we look at how they respond to things like sound, uh, like underwater sound, like uh, an engine revving or um, an erratic uh, underwater sound that they, they do not get used to, uh, strobe lights, um, carbon dioxide being pumped into the water. And um, we start off with the lab experiments. If, if those look promising, that there's a, um, a, a response that suggests that that the carp does not like these, um, these stimuli, then we tried in the, the, the larger setting, the mesocosm in, in the Great Lakes proper, and then that looks pro promising. We've tried several of them in, in the wild. And uh, the one thing we've noticed is uh, we can elicit the responses we want. That is, we want you know, um, carp not to cross the barrier, or we want to direct them in a certain direction in the lab in very small um, conditions, uh, it's harder to do when you, uh, you scale it up to a mesocosm, you know, a large area, enclosed area within the Great Lakes. And it's even harder to do in the wild where you, you don't have any enclosures. So the most promising of the, the barriers is a carbon dioxide barrier. And uh, we will continue to research that, uh, that option and, and determine whether or not it's actually practical to use it in the wild. That's really interesting. Much, Nick. Um, we're going to get to our next panelist now. So we'll see you at the audience questions. Next up, we have Brooke Schreier from the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. Hello, Brooke. Hi. And hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having uh, me. Yeah, anytime. <laughs> Always. <laughs> so my first question for you is, what should an angler do if they suspect they've caught a grass carp? Well, you know, first and foremost, I think uh, Becky said it best in that, you know, all hot, all eyes on the water is, is really important. And, you know, when folks are on the water, whether they're, you know, out for a cruise or out angling, um, they should always have 
uh, you know, these species in mind when, when they're, you know, especially in, in coastal regions, um, just in case they do encounter what they suspect is an invasive grass carp. Um, first and foremost, you know, the thing that comes to mind is, is good photos, um, but I will break it down. You know, like if somebody's captured a fish and you suspect it's a grass carp, you know, hopefully you can become quite confident in a short amount of time, whether you actually have a grass carp or not. Um, there are some great resources that exist. I know asiancarp.ca uh, houses many awesome resources. We have resources at invadingspecies.com. Uh, especially on our Asian Carps page, where we have a, a lookalike fact sheet that anybody can download and maybe just keep it in your in your tackle box. So, you know, in a circumstance where you catch a fish and you think it's a grass carp, you could look at this fact sheet, help you differentiate between, um, you know, native and non-native lookalike species, um, but really just help you really come to a conclusive, you know, kind of idea around what species you have. Um, basically, whether it's a grass carp or not, right? If it's not, then you should probably be putting that fish back. Uh, in the circumstance that you, you suspect you have a grass carp in your possession uh, and you're very confident in that identification after all the, you know, looking at the fact sheet and looking online and all that, um, that's where you need to, you know, make sure that you're not releasing that fish, um, that you're, you're killing that suspected grass carp and not returning it to the water. Uh, you're gonna wanna make sure that you, you gut that fish or eviscerate that fish and then put it on ice kind of as soon as possible, right? And then report it. So you're going to want to report that uh, via the Invading Species Hotline, which is 1-800-563-7711. Um, alternatively, you can email us, info at invadingspecies.com. And then finally, you can actually just report via the EdMaps app. Um, EdMaps is the Early Detection and Distribution Mapping System. You can do that via the app or via the web page. You know, again, capture some good photos, upload them, report them to us. Um, anytime a, a you know Asian carp report comes through, it's looked at as quickly as, as humanly possible. And you know, when we receive that, what we're going to do is make sure that uh, all that information that's been sent into us is then passed on to partners um, like Department of Fisheries and Oceans and the uh, NDMNRF. I think they've just recently changed their name. Um, so the provincial partners as well to make sure that you know. One, if you have the fish in your possession, that you can get it to DFO so they can actually analyze the fish. Uh, that's where they find out all sorts of important information about where it came from, uh, whether it's a uh, triploid or a diploid, so fertile or, or sterile, as well as you know other pertinent information. So that's if you've captured it. Now, if you've just seen it, this is where it gets a bit tricky because you, know, you saw in that video with David Marson, most likely what you're going to see is the top of the fish. So it's pretty hard to discern what type of fish you're looking at simply by looking at the top of it. But, you know, in the circumstance that maybe you're on the beach or you're in near shore and you see the fish kind of sunning itself in shallow water and you're highly confident in, its, in your identification, it's all about trying to get that clear photograph. Um, you know, try to capture some of those the key characteristics and then use one of those reporting tools that I that I mentioned before and just get those reports in uh, as soon as possible. Since April 1st this year, we've had 26 Asian carp reports um, of which, you know, it's broken down based on what people are reporting, mostly grass carp. Um, and, you know, 100% of those have been misidentifications, uh, native species, uh, you know, other non-natives or other invasives. Um, but most of the time it's lookalikes. But we have over the years uh, had a few confirmed reports actually come in. And as I said, we follow the protocols to get it to our partners as soon as humanly possible. Awesome. Um, so you mentioned that if you have the grass carp in or a grass carp in your possession, you should gut it and kill it. Is there a specific way of doing that to make sure that DFO gets what they need out of it? Um, I mean, I think honestly, that's a that's a really good question for you know the David Marsons of the world. Um, the main thing there is that you're just when you're when you're you know euthanizing the fish that you're not banging it on the head, right? I know a lot of anglers, myself included, over the years, you catch a nice fish that you want to keep. The the kind of instinct there and what we've been taught generationally is buff it on the head, right? But it's really important that you don't do that. And you know the reason why is because DFO, uh, their biologists, they'll analyze the otolith bone, yeah, so their ear bone essentially. And if you are bopping it on the head, there's a probably a pretty good chance that you're going to break that. You're going to you're going to you know damage that otolith. So you know the main thing is just getting that fish out of the water and and, and gutting it. You know uh, many anglers who are experienced um, at, at fishing and at, at retaining fish for the sake of consumption will be quite skilled in, in doing that. And they'll know that, you know, okay, I, I, I know how to get a fish. Um, so, 
yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned that you get a lot of, you've had a lot of reports so far this year, and they've thankfully none of them have been a grass carp. Um, what is the most commonly reported species that is mistaken for grass carp in these reports? Yeah, yeah. So it really depends on the species that somebody suspects they've encountered. So, you know, the majority of the time when somebody suspects they've seen a grass carp, uh, you're talking things like fall fish, which is you know, the largest native minnow that we have uh, in Ontario. There's also things like creek chub. And immediately, if, if you're familiar with those two fish species, the first thing you're thinking is, oh, okay, they're, they're you know, typically olive green in coloration. Um, for their size, being smaller fish, they have relatively large scales. Um, which are two characteristics that, you know, based on photos of, of uh, grass carp and what people are familiar with, with grass carp, they think, oh, these, these characteristics line up. And in those circumstances, what you're really going to look for is, you know, mouth morphology. David Marson really um, showed you the, a good image of the, the mouth of the, the grass carp, as well as eye placement. Eye placement is really key. Um, with a grass carp, you're going to notice the eye placement is uncharacteristically low. Um, as opposed to you know, your fall fish and, and other um, species, look like species where normally the eyes are, are much higher on the head. Um, besides that, you always get the usual culprits. Um, like, you know, we, we've had multiple white sucker reports, which are, which are strange. White suckers are quite different. Um, but similarly with common carp, common carp is another species which often gets misidentified as, as grass carp. So, you know, you name it, we've had it reported. We even had a, a freshwater drum recently reported. and you know, all it was was a was a head uh, that was quite decomposed. It was uh, quite quite the uh, quite the report, but yeah, we were confident in consultation with you know Erling Holm and others uh, that it was actually a freshwater drum and not a grass carp. Uh, again, eye placement was was key in that one. But then when you get into species like silver carp, big head carp, you know, if you guys are familiar familiar with it. Um, you know, you know that obviously they kind of live up to their name, they're more silvery in color, they're much smaller scales. So in those circumstances, you're more so starting to lean towards things like gizzard shad, um, which are a relatively deep bodied native fish species that we have in the Great Lakes Basin that, you know, seasonally you can, you can notice die offs and they're actually pretty prone to, to jumping out of the water. So people see a silver fish leaping out of the water and they immediately think, oh, it's a silver carp. But in reality, what it is, is it's actually a gizzard shad. Um, and then, you know, like alewife, uh, just essentially any, any silver, uh, silver in, in coloration, deep bodied fish, uh, people will, will think, oh, potentially a silver carp and, and no fault to them. You know, identifying fish is exceptionally hard, um, especially if you're not a seasoned, you know, angler or ichthyologist, uh, hopefully I said that right. So it can be very challenging. Uh, and what I would encourage people to do is just really become more familiar with our awesome species that we have in Ontario, as well as these invasive species. Again, there's lots of great resources at invadingspecies.com to help you with that. Uh, you know, similarly, again, with asiancarp.ca, there's the, the bait fish primer. There's so many great resources out there to help people become more familiar with fish identification that would really help when it comes to reporting. But that being said, I will never fault somebody for reporting whatever it is that they suspect that they've captured. Um, you know, if you have the, the slightest inkling that it could be an Asian carp, you know, whatever species, make sure you take those key photographs, you know, good, clean, clear photographs and send them to us because, you know, no matter what the species is, we're going to follow up with you and let you know. So if it ends up being a smallmouth bass, it doesn't matter to me. I, I will tell you and I will point you in the direction of, of resources. So it's always best that people are reporting, uh, you know, but step number one, learning to ID, uh, but if all else fails, you know, clear photographs and send it in. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's so true. I think it's really great to see that a lot of reports come in because I think it means that people are concerned and and they're trying to be vigilant and aid in early detection. So that's really awesome to hear. And I'm very happy to hear that there's been no positive reports this year too. So thank you very much, Brooke. Um, we'll chat with you again when we open it up to audience questions. Talk soon. So last but not least, we have Tim Purdy joining us on the panel. Hello, Hello Tim. <laughs> so my first question for you is, have you seen a grass carp before on the job? Actually, yes, we've, we've caught in several over the years. Uh, the last one we caught was in a trap net. 
I think it was 2018, 2019. And um, it was caught in a trap net. It was right close to shore. It was probably six miles east of the Blue Water Bridge, but right in the south end of Lake Huron. Yes, and you actually won, or well, not won, you received an award. <laughs> I shouldn't say won, that's not a win. Um, yeah. You received an award from Fisheries and Oceans Canada from the Asian Carp Canada program for, for reporting and aiding in early detection. So that's really awesome. Um, my next question is, how would grass carp impact you, your career and, and your commercial fishery? Um, they, they don't yet, but... Um... I'll speak for like for Southern Lake Huron, where I predominantly fish, like say from uh, Bayfield to Sarnia, that's basically our fishing zone. And in Southern, like over the last 30 years, like since the zebra mussels came in, there's been a lot of big changes to the fishing community in, in, the, in Huron. And some fish, uh, when the zebra mussels came in, it depleted their food sources. So they had to change food sources like whitefish, for example. Um, over the last four or five years, we've seen a lot of walleye or pickerel. That stock's really come on strong. The whitefish have really bounced back. Um, the lake trout, unfortunately, are plentiful. Um, that's my commercial fish <laughs> chap. <laughs> Anyways, um, and uh, and the perch are kind of hit and miss depending on, you know, the prey species that are around. But it's such an intricate level where one overlaps the other and and, and things like that, that if something like the grass carp were to come in, I honestly believe it would decimate not only the commercial fishing, but the sport fishing. And the, you know, the, the weekender that, that goes to Grand Bend on the weekend and they want to catch some fish or, or they just even want to go to a fish store and buy fish, that'll all be gone. I think that'll all disappear if the grass carp get a hold in the Great Lakes. And it, it's, it's a scary, scary problem, and it's and it's unfortunately it's out of our control right now. It's out of the commercial fishermen's control. You know, we appreciate the efforts that are being done to stop this now, and uh, you know, we appreciate our association, our membership, our back you guys 110% for the the work you do, and um, we just hope it's not too little, too late. That's what scares us. Well, it's definitely great that there's commercial fishermen like you that are that are trained and you know what you're looking for and and you can report. Um, before we wrap up with you, would you be able to kind of like I guess walk us through like what happened when you caught one? What did you do? How did I guess how did it go? Um, well, it was uh, one of my employees, one of my boat captains, Ralph Pike. He was the one that was running the boat that day, and and when he got it, he knew right away. He didn't. He wasn't 100% sure it was a grass carp. He just knew it was something that we don't catch every day. And it was something that we bring in, keep it aside, put it right in the cooler. And once you get in, you start making phone calls. Now, unfortunately, a couple of years ago, there really wasn't the chain of command. You call this person and that person. It took a day or two to get to the right people. But I think those, you know, those chains have been fixed with all the, you know, the things that you guys put out there. Um, so the education's there now that if somebody off the pier in Grand Bend catches one, they can find the information very easily. Where when we did a couple of years ago, we call administ like the MNR in Owen Sound and then they pass it on and pass it on. And, but I think the chain has been fixed and it's a it's a good reporting system. Definitely. Well, thank you so much, Tim. Um, and now we're going to open it up to audience questions so please feel free to type some in and uh, ask our panel again if you don't mind redirecting them to a specific person if you can uh, if not no worries we'll figure it out but our first question is and this one came through registration because we did have a few that came in um, earlier on so how are we preventing them from getting into the Great Lakes? And do we have a plan of action if they do establish a reproducing population? So I think I'll pass that one to Becky. Yes, yeah, so uh, we've, we've done quite a bit to, to uh, basically put up roadblocks. So the first thing we needed to do was to understand what roads or routes they could take to get into the Great Lakes. And um, 
you know, obviously they're used to to minimize the impact of aquatic macro, uh, aquatic vegetation was one of those ways. So um, from rearing ponds in the U.S., they used to be brought in or imported into Canada, and we were able to uh, we recognize that that was a, something we needed to, to block. And so we did implement legislation that prevents the, um, the live trade of grass carp. Uh, you can still bring them across the border, but they have to be dead and my favorite word, eviscerated, so that we know that indeed uh, they're not alive. The other um, roadblocks are a little bit more difficult, to be honest, though, because it becomes, as Nick said, it becomes very difficult to be setting up these physical barriers from individuals in, in the American waters of the U.S. to stop them from swimming to the Canadian waters. Um, so, you know, despite our border being closed, it isn't closed for fish, fishes to uh, be moving over. So what we need to do is we work with the U.S. We spent, uh, pre-COVID, we spent a lot of time working with the U.S. to better understand uh, what was going on with numbers and individuals of grass carp down there, as well as to work with the U.S. and removing as many grass carp as we were able to. Uh, to minimize uh, the, the ability of that population to establish and, and spread. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure how successful we are. We were um, because there are there are pockets of grass carp in the western basin of Lake Erie on the U.S. side um, where there's well-established numbers. So the next best thing we can do is just try to minimize their ability to get a hold and establish in Canada. And that's why we've taken our, our, our previous early detection map. And if people want to pop out uh, to the Lampton Museum tomorrow, we, we have a map of where we would normally sample for these species. So using that um, prioritized river system, we would sample all the Great Lakes in uh, Canada. And over time, as this grass carp threat just becomes stronger and stronger and more imminent, we've been like narrowing our scope, our geographic scope, and now we really strongly focus on the western basin of Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, and the southern basin of Lake Huron. Um, so that's how we're trying to deal with preventing them from re really just getting a hold or becoming established in Canada, because through that route, we can't stop them necessarily. Um, do we have a plan of action if they establish? That is a great question. When we think about the uh, continuum of a species invading, they have to arrive, then they have to survive, and then they have to establish. Um, and then the next, next steps are, are spread. So we are really focused right now on preventing arrival or preventing establishment, excuse me, because we know that our dollars are best spent there. We know that we can have the greatest impact if we prevent establishment. Uh, thinking ahead to a plan of action if they establish, well, we are starting to think about what kinds of things and we could learn, what kinds of tools could be developed. And that's where Dr. Mandrak comes in um, and getting that research done ahead of time. So we're not going to wait for the species to establish and then think about what do we add to our toolbox. We're starting that thinking now. And when we get a, if, if we get a little closer, uh, to an established population, we can use that information to develop a plan. Awesome, thank you. So our next question um, comes from MPP Mike Harris, the Parliamentary Assistant to the Ministry of NDMRF. Gonna have to get used to that one. Um, and the question is for Nick. Could you highlight some of the ways that eDNA can help us identify areas where carp species may exist? And he also says hello to Tim Purdy. Sure. Uh, so environment, eDNA is short for environmental DNA. And uh, it refers to DNA that is found in the environment because it's being shed by an animal like a fish. And fish are particularly good at shedding their DNA because they're slimy and they, um, they defecate and they urinate in their aquatic environment. And their slime and their feces and their urine all contain uh, DNA. And so what we can do is we can uh, take a sample of water uh, that um, has 
those DNA particles in it, and we can basically do DNA fingerprinting uh, to identify uh, who that DNA belongs to. So the the, um, the science of, of using eDNA to monitor fishes is, is evolving, and it's evolving very quickly. And it's a it's a very I think it's a very reliable tool tool now to detect pre the presence of a, a species. Uh, it's still not uh, able to we're still not able to reliably uh, determine the abundance of a species based on on um, eDNA. The other thing that I will um, also point out about eDNA is just like using conventional gear like what DFO uses, spike nets and, and electrofishing and so on, it's often difficult to detect species in very low abundance. So for example, if you had one grass carp in say Lake St. Clair, regardless of using eDNA techniques or conventional techniques, it would be very difficult to, to detect it, right? So when species are in very low abundance, it's very di difficult to detect them with either conventional or eDNA methods. Um, what, what's the advantage of using eDNA um, over these conventional methods? Well, potentially, in, you know, once the method is the methods are, are fully developed and operationalized, um, they will likely cost less than uh, using conventional methods, and they'll, they'll cost less from several perspectives. The actual cost of the infrastructure, uh, so nets and boats and uh, electrofishing units can can be very expensive, um, and the, uh, the and also you would save costs in terms of manpower. You don't need a crew of three or four people to go out and collect DNA, eDNA, and you can collect eDNA at more sites in a given day than you can sample with conventional gear. Uh, so I think uh, there are a lot of potential advantages of using eDNA, and I'm glad that it's being used in conjunction with conventional sampling. Um, we do have to decide, uh, well, we, we do have to get to a point where everyone, from, from the researchers, through the biologists, through the, the, the environmental managers, and, and even the politicians making decisions, are comfortable with the results of environmental DNA and are confident that they represent a, a, a live uh, body uh, in the water body from which they were detected. Thank you, Nick. And thank you so much, um, Mike, for joining us and for your question. The next question is for Brooke. Why do we need to gut the Asian carp if we catch one? Um, do we keep the guts? Does DFO need to look at any other like stomach content or anything like that? Or do we toss it overboard? Uh, again, I think this is a fantastic question for DFO since, you know, they're the ones that really uh, handle that type of stuff. But that being said, you know, I, I can speak to it a little bit. Um, it's really to, to reduce the risk of, you know, fish having reproductive, um, you know, organs within uh, its actual being. So it's really important that they be uh, eviscerated for that reason. I know that a big part of the motivation when um, you know the regulations were coming into place were that you know a dead fish uh, can be resusc resuscitated uh, quite easily. Again, like if you're an angler and you've gone ice fishing and you put a, a fish on the on the ice for a day without bopping it on the head, and then hours later uh, you've gone taken it home, you'll you'll find that sometimes they can really come back from what you think is the dead. So I know that in the past, and, and Becky, you can you can jump in too, but I know that there was uh, a circumstance where, you know, because of the new regulation, folks were just draining water out of uh, their trucks and claiming that the fish were dead and then putting them on ice and then crossing the border into Canada, at which point, you know, they would put them back in water and many of the fish would come back to life. And this was really fundamentally for the food markets. Um, so that's where, you know, we, we decided uh, or the, you know, government decided, hey, you know, this is important that these fish are eviscerated. So there's no question about whether or not the fish are dead. It's very clear at that point. Um, so really, that's that's the main rationale there, I think. 
if I can just add to that as a perfect answer, and, and we do have to kind of balance protecting uh, the environment and protecting and learning from these species and like how much we ask of people. So um, if you're really keen and you put those guts in a bag, we would be grateful to take them because we do we do send pieces of these fish all over the place in North America for different studies and gut content. It would be great. We'd love to know what the fish is eating um, in terms of the species of the plant and things like that. But um, you know, we, we do try to minimize how much we're asking of the public and anglers. And, and um, so we, we just have to be, and how much messaging overload there might be. So I think what Brooke is saying is, yeah, we do have to make sure we're protecting the environment that eggs aren't getting in maybe um, and becoming a problem. And, um, and then with DNA, we don't want that DNA in the water as well. So that's sort of our first level. Um, but yeah, if anyone was really keen and found one and wanted to send me stomach contents, uh, send them my way. Thank you, Maggie, for uh, adding to that. Thanks, guys. The next question uh, came through our registration. How long before we start seeing Asian carps in Lake Huron waters, or are they already here? So I think I'll probably ask Becky to start with that one, and then maybe if um, Nick wants to add anything. I can maybe start with like the current situation, and, um, and Nick's, Nick's familiar with some of the modeling um, that's been done for predicting the future. So the current situation, are they in the Southern Lake Huron? Well, I think we know that, I mean, Tim's found a few. Um, and we also know that they're there because um, the states of Michigan and Ohio have been tagging live grass carp in their waters and releasing them. And they do that and release them live to see where they go. So they track them to see, you know, what habitats are they going into? Um, what rivers are they going into? And it was surprising to see the results. The results were they were visiting Canada. So they would be moving up through the Detroit River and getting into Southern Lake Huron. Um, so helpful information. We we did know that they were going to be there. It just sort of um, uh, confirmed what we suspected and, and have seen in terms of evidence. And um, so we do know that they're there. I will flag that we have not caught very many. And Tim's actually caught the most. Uh, so he kind of wins. And um, but that we don't haven't seen any signs of uh, established populations at all. So, and then uh, Nick, if you want to talk about modeling in the future. Yeah, I, I don't think I have too much to add. Uh, we, we did do a bi-national risk assessment on, on grass carp with uh, both the, the American and Canadian governments participating and agreeing to the outcome of that risk assessment. And at the time, I, I think we had considered that they had, they had arrived to the basin. Uh, and... Uh, so the question now is how long does it take before they become established? And uh, there are several uh, highly suitable tributaries in, in Lake St. Clair in, in terms of the Thames River. The Thames River looks like an almost perfect uh, spawning tributary for uh, grass carp, well, any of the Asian carps. And in fact, I was on the Thames a couple of weeks ago and it just, Again, I, it reminded me about just how much this looks like where they are currently spawning in the United States. And then in, in, in Lake Huron, there are uh, rivers like the Asabo River that are also likely highly suitable. So, um, you know, we can't really predict how long it's going to take until they become established, hope, other than hopefully never, uh, if we continue to detect them early enough that we can um, prevent them from spawning. And I should point out, uh, I myself was, was not in favor of tagging and releasing any grass carp in the Great Lakes as they've done in the States. Um, but because they had done it, uh, I, I think that we should take the, the, the knowledge required. And, and, and basically what, what it has shown us is that it supports basically the modeling that, we've all, that we have done. And it's always nice to have real data that supports uh, you know, an ecological model. But I think we have enough information now to say, uh, let's stop doing the tagging of the grass carp and let's just keep uh, responding to um, reports and, and killing them as they are found, everyone that is found in the Great Lakes. 
Thank you. The next question is for Tim. If any, what other invasive species have your boats caught out on the water? Um, we, we don't get a lot of, of uh, species up in Huron. Um, some of the things we might get, I, I consider, uh, you know, are, are something like um, a white perch. You know, it's a nuisance fish. Um, they're not natural to Huron, and yet every three or four years we get a class of white perch that sort of run through the the fishery. They don't really get big enough to, to fish, but they're just sort of there as a nuisance. So, I mean, you had the zebra mussels and then the gobies. Those were the two really big ones, but we don't really see a lot up here like they would down on the, in Lake Erie. Thank you. Uh, the next question, I believe I will direct to Nick, and it is, where can we find a good taxonomic key for carps? Uh, well, I, I think uh, DFO and the Invasive Species Center um, and, and uh, Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters all have, have um, uh, excellent materials. I can see some of them over Brooke's shoulder, in fact. And I think the key is is to be able not necessarily to distinguish among the, the Asian carp species, but rather distinguish them from native species. That's really the key. And, and um, you know, Brooke went over that earlier. Uh, and, and be aware of the species that are they're mo most likely to be native species that they're most likely to be confused with. Uh, so that's the key. Uh, I, I will point out that um, I'm, I'm currently, currently um, writing the second edition of a ROM field guide to Ontario fishes, and uh, we we have we have included the four species, and we do provide information on how how, how to distinguish them from similar species. And interestingly, just today, uh, my co-authors and I were going through the section that included grass carp. And we decided to include a photo of a, uh, of a juvenile grass carp, one that's probably less than a year old, because it looks so much like a native minnow. That it, like we said, we have to include that just to reinforce how much this looks like just any other native minnow in Ontario, like a fall fish or a creek chub or even a golden shiner, even though the scales are bigger. But if you look at that, you're like, yeah, that's a minnow, right? Uh, so uh, there are a lot of excellent resources out there, but the key is to, to remember the characteristics that distinguish them from uh, the native species, uh, because they can be difficult to, to distinguish from each other. Thank you. Um, the next one is for Tim and others, likely. Um, do you see any potential to try and fish down the population if they do become established? Um, and then I think the second part maybe could go to Becky, and that would be: Has there been any success in the U.S. where there, where this has been tried, and is there a potential market? Well, we um, if they got established, I back in the '90s we used to haul a, a lot of live fish, a lot of walleye catfish they go into ohio indiana illinois michigan and everybody in ohio has a pond in their backyard and in those ponds they would stock with walleye catfish but in the 90s everybody had one or two grass carp in their pond and they put all their grass clippings in there and you know it basically keep the pond clean for them so i think that would be the only market but i think that's what got us into this problem because people were raising them for that, so um, I, I honestly don't think there would be a market for them unless there was a system put in place where, um, like you know, in um, Iowa, there's there's lakes there that are right full of lake trout, and lake trout are not the natural fish for that lake. So they actually pay fishermen to go and catch the lake trout to get them out of the lake, just so that everybody else can enjoy the lake. And that's all those fishermen do five days a week is catch lake trout that's all they do and the government pays them to do it so i mean if anything happened and they got established and it would probably have to be a joint venture with the governments and we try to get rid of them as quick as we can 
I, I don't think there'd be any value in the meat or anything else, but it, it would be a costly adventure, but I, that's the only thing I could see that might work. Sorry, I was muted. But just to tag on it and to answer the um, the other part of the question. So, you know, I, I know I've, I've been asked, you know, we, we do such a great job um, fishing species to extinction, um, like commercial fishing in the ocean. Why can't we do that, use that as a tool? And it's a great idea, but it comes down to the ecological characteristics of species. And so pe species have different groups of these ecological characteristics, and some species are very vulnerable to overfishing and become extinct. And some species have a collection of ecological characteristics that make them good invaders and not so vulnerable to overfishing. And so grass carp sort of ha has those characteristics of obviously an invasive species. Uh, it has been used, it is being used in the States, in the state of Illinois for uh, big head and silver carp. And what they've managed to do, which is, which is, a value to us is basically we can think of them as the gatekeepers to the Great Lakes. So they have managed to prevent that moving front or that moving army of those two species from, from continuing on. So they keep fishing down, but as Tim said, through subsidized commercial fishing, and it is very costly, but they finish fish down the numbers so that there's uh, no reason for them to continue moving. Um, and that population front, as it's known, or that leading edge, hasn't moved in more than a decade, which is great news. But it isn't having an impact on removing the rest of the population downstream. Um, is there a potential market? It has been tried in the states various ways. Um, they've tried um, selling selling back to cities in Asia where there was a strong market for them. They've tried creating zoo food to feed zoo animals. They've tried pet food. They've tried um, fertilizer and compost. And nothing is really taking off enough to deal with the thousands and thousands of tons of fish that they have. Uh, but they're, they're still trying. And their latest technique is maybe to rename it and try to get it into uh, mainstream restaurants and markets. So that's been done before with other um, marine fish where the name is maybe not so palatable, like monkfish is, is uh, uh, known as um, something, now I forget, something lobster, right? Because it's got the texture of lobster. People like lobster, but they may not like a monkfish. So this is, this is a new technique. So it is potentially there, but what, we've, what the U.S. has tried so far hasn't quite worked um, as well as they had hoped. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Nick. Have you considered doing any types of research uh, with pheromones similar to what's being tested with sea lamprey? Yes, uh, we, we actually have, have done pheromone research. Uh, so there's two types of pheromones that, uh, that Asian carps, uh, well, at least two types that, that Asian carps emit. One would be a, um, a, a sex pheromone that would be an attractant, and one would be a, an alarm pheromone uh, that would be a repellent. And uh, we've attempted, uh, we've extracted what we believe was the alarm pheromone from, from common carp, and then uh, when we, we bubbled it into water, uh, the common carp were not repelled by it at all, right? Uh, we have not tried, I think, uh, so it's easy to extract the, the alarm pheromone, the repellent. I think it's a lot harder to extract the, the, uh, the uh, sex uh, pheromone. Uh, sometimes it's done by caging uh, mature individuals in a certain area and allowing them to naturally emit the pheromone. Uh, but uh, no one has done, has, 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 to my knowledge, has, has worked um, at the same level of detail as they've done for sea lamprey. Uh, the one thing I want to point out is, um, why would we look at both pheromones? Well, when we think about uh, barriers, we should, we should think about 
really two types of barriers, preventing the carp from going somewhere where we don't want them to go by creating a barrier, or perhaps um, also directing them to a location that we want them to go because we know they cannot, for example, spawn there, right? So, so when we think about barriers, we should think about not just strictly oh, preventing them from going up this, this, this uh, tributary that's suitable for spawning, but should also consider can we can we encourage them to go somewhere where if they spawn, you know, the eggs are going to drop down into the sediment and and, and not be viable. Uh, so yeah, getting back to the original question, we we have looked at alarm pheromones, but not not uh, sex pheromones. Okay, um, the next question is. Are grass carp a threat to the Kingston area currently, or is there a potential threat to the area? So I think I'll pass that one to Becky. Yes, um, we, did have, we did a risk assessment with the U.S. for the entire Great Lakes Basin, and it was published in 2017, um, available online if you need any maps, because uh, what you'll see is uh, pretty much the entire basin of Lake Ontario is at risk. Um, there has been uh, there has been grass carp ca caught in that basin in the eastern basin of Lake Ontario, and so we know it's possible. There hasn't been nearly as many, but there isn't nearly the population source available as there is in Lake Erie. And uh, yeah, so I would just uh, simply say, are they a threat to the Kingston area? Yes. Thank you. I would add that if you look at Cataraqui Creek, the wetland, when you drive it along the 401, that is looks like ideal foraging habitat for grass carp. And, and we have identified suitable spawning tributaries uh, in the area as well. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is for you, Nick. And um, this person says that your research is very interesting, involving strobe lights, noise, uh, et cetera. Have you also been looking at how these stimuli would affect native fish? Uh, yes, we have. And one of the one of the sort of the theoretical reasons for looking at 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 noise sound is because uh, the Asian carps are part of a group of fishes that also include native minnows. Uh, that and, and catfishes that have a highly sensitive uh, hearing system where their ear is connected to their lateral line. And, um, you know, it's been shown in lab experiments that they are more sensitive to sound. Uh, with, our hopes was that, that we'd be able to deter carps and we, we, we may end up deterring uh, native minnows, but they are not as migratory as, say, native salmonids that do not have the same hearing structure. And um, unfortunately, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've shown that, yeah, certainly we can see um, that sound has a higher effect on, on uh, the carps and, and those fishes that have that sensitive hearing and lesser effect on other species like, uh, like basses. Uh, however, the effect in our field experiment was not strong enough to say this is a good barrier. We, we, could, we only reduced common carp by about 18%. And part of that is uh, because we were doing the experiment in an area that actually had a noisy underwater environment. And so uh, the incremental increase in, in, in noise uh, that we added uh, was not sufficient, uh, I, we think, the, to, to repel carp. However, if, and we were, we were topping out at maybe 160 decibels. However, if you were to go any higher, uh, it actually, the, the carp, uh, hearing apparatus become desensitized to that noise. So that's why we think the sound did not work well in, in, in the wild. Uh, it, there's the potential that in less noisy systems that sound might work better uh, and we could potentially do those experiments in the future. 
but we do recognize that a lot of areas that are suitable for carp are near highways and other, you know, other sources of, of underwater noise. So uh, it sound, even if, if we found it to be effective under quiet environments, uh, there may only be limited areas where we could actually use it. Uh, regarding CO2, our carbon dioxide uh, barrier was highly effective. Unfortunately, it prevented the passage of all species, uh, except uh, I should point out, um, interestingly, uh, catfishes. And it, it, we believe that they were actually an attractant to, to native catfishes because catfishes appear to use CO2 to detect their prey on the bottom. Right, so they're they're feeding on animals on the bottom, and they're detecting them by detecting the CO2. But uh, CO2 um, uh, impacts uh, most native species as well as as common carp. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is for you as well, and it's this person is interested in learning about potential graduate opportunities in your lab. And um, just out of curiosity, if you extend your research to goldfish also. Oh, it's, uh, it, it's interesting that they bring that up because goldfish is the next species we're working on. And uh, we're working on it from a couple of different angles. The, it, it seems like goldfish abundance has gone up quite dramatically in the last decade. And I'll point out that goldfish have been around since the late 1800s in the Great Lakes, and and they they reproduce, um, and they have always been at low in a low abundances that likely limited their impacts. Uh, it appears that uh, you know I hypothesize that their abundance is increasing quite dramatically because um, because of climate change, and that the the climates are becoming more suitable for goldfish. Uh, a goldfish can tolerate lower oxygen very, very low oxygen levels for longer periods of time than just about any other fish in the Great Lakes. And when you have increasing temperatures, you often have decreasing oxygen levels. And this may make the Great Lakes um, more, uh, you know, uh, better for goldfish. I think we, you know, we still have to determine what that actual, the actual impact of goldfish could be. I have a colleague at uh, McGill University who's been doing some experiments to help us better understand what the impacts could be. Um, there's also, we also think that there's the potential for new introductions of goldfish into the Great Lakes from people dumping their unwanted pets, right? And, and not just into the Great Lakes, but into a lot of these, you know, urban and suburban ponds, stormwater retention ponds that when in flood conditions may overflow into what into the wild. And that may actually introduce potentially um, new genes uh, that make the goldfish more adaptable to even harsher environments. But right now this is a hypothesis, but we are developing uh, a new research program to specifically look at this. And because goldfish are already in the Great Lakes, um, uh, you know, and we can do some of these impact experiments before we do a risk assessment to determine what the actual risk is. Unlike species that are not yet in the, the, in the Great Lakes, we want to do those risk assessments first and then do the experiments to determine, uh, to refine our estimates of impact. But I think with goldfish, the time, what we should be doing right now is better understanding the impacts uh, and, then, and then doing a, a risk assessment based on based on that to determine whether or not uh, we, we should um, take further action on controlling them. And if the student is interested in contacting me, they could find me at just by Googling me at University of Toronto or going to mandraclab.ca, uh, which is my lab website. Great, thank you. Um, you can also probably reach out to me at the Invasive Species Center. My contact information will be up at the end just in case. Um... You need an alternate way to connect with Nick. Um, our next question is for Brooke. Is bait fish a possible pathway of spread of introduction for um, Asian carps? Um, yeah, uh, you know, I think just putting it really bluntly, um, definitely, uh, you know, because of the nature of the establishment within the US, um, you know, there's always the potential that somebody could illegally import uh, juvenile 
grass carp or Asian carps in a bait bucket. So, you know, one of the ways that we try to educate anglers and, and people who potentially, you know, have bait buckets um, is through training. We do have a partnership program called the Hazard Analysis and Critical Control Point, or HACCP for short. It was originally developed uh, for NASA and then adapted for the food industry. And we actually use it uh, in Ontario um, for training bait harvesters. So any bait harvester who you know will be out collecting collecting bait for themselves, um, like to sell or something along those lines, they have to go through this training. And within that training, we do educate them on Asian carps, what juveniles would look like. Um, the fear that I have is that you know if we were to get an established population and these things start reproducing, you know it's already hard enough for people to differentiate uh, between adults. Um, so you know if you add that added complexity of trying to differentiate between juvenile uh, grass carps or, or other Asian carps and many of our minnow species, it's gonna be a huge challenge um, for many people. Uh, so let's just hope we never get there. But yeah, to answer the question, certainly bait buckets could be um, a pathway. And that's why we always encourage people, obviously check your bait buckets, make sure that you're getting your, your bait from reputable suppliers. Uh, try to buy it locally. You know, if you're, if you're fishing on Lake Simcoe in the winter months, make sure that you're buying it locally. Um, always being aware of what's in there and never dumping your bait buckets. It is against the law to dump your bait buckets. It's always really important that you either uh, salt and freeze your bait for later use or dispose of it at least 30 meters away from the shoreline. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Becky. And um, it's a good question that is actually also going to be addressed in our follow-up survey. Um, we're hoping to hear from everyone on this topic as well. The question is, will the term Asian carps be reconsidered at some point? Yeah, so I, we, we know that there's been um, it's a change with, some, with a gypsy moth, for example. Um, so gypsy being a, a, a specific slur against a group of people um, ha, has, has been changed and now those moths are known as LDD. Um, the same sort of thing seems to be coming up, or sort of the same, seems to be coming up um, in social media, unfortunately, where we're using the term Asian carp because they are from the continent of Asia. Uh, but people are using this um, that we, you know, we don't want Asian carp here, they, they cause impacts, and they're taking that completely out of context and using it as bad things come from Asia. And uh, we can think of many examples um, of words that are being used um, in terms of a tool of hate towards a group of people. So uh, it is being considered. I would really, really uh, like to hear what people think about that because there's a lot to, to take into account um, to change or not to change the name. Some departments in the U.S. Uh, government have decided that uh, they would rather use the term invasive carp, uh, but uh, it's something I could recommend using because there's well over 100 species of carps out there, and where it's invasive depends on where you stand in, in North America. So I find that's a very ambiguous and confusing term. Um, there is a, a group of taxonomic experts that do just actually get together and decide the formal names of fish. That does exist. Um, so that may be something that we have a conversation with that group about. Uh, but in the meantime, I, I would welcome if people had opinions, you can get can connect with me through Rebecca. Uh, because if um, you know this is a tool of hate that bothers me. Uh, personally, if um, but it will have pretty significant implications, um, or it may derail the progress we've made on outreach and education. So, I'd love to hear from both sides. Thank you, Becky. And yeah, we we have that question in our follow up survey. So, really interested to get some feedback on that. If um, you could take the time to fill it out, we would love to hear your thoughts. The next question I think will be for Becky and Nick. Um, are there any potential problem fish that may be added to the list in the future? 
Uh, for example, Prussian carp populations are appearing in city ponds out west, and some aquarium enthusiasts do not follow regulations or see them as a challenge. Um, I'm not sure what lists, so I could interpret that as to the group of carps that we may manage or deal with, or if they mean like a regulatory list. Uh, Prussian carp, definitely a species of concern. Um, I do manage the ARS program in the prairie provinces, and, and Prussian carp is one of our priority species uh, that we work with the provinces on. This, this is a carp species that um, quadruples its distribution uh, quite uh, every year, so it's a very prolific spreader. Um, would we put that on, a, on regulations? Potentially, yes. Um, we need to, we have a formal process that we um, would need to implement in order to do that. And that would include assessing risks and, and uh, social economic implications. And, um, but if you meant, uh, yeah, if we would include it in with uh, the Asian carp uh, terminology, no, because uh, Asian carp is, is the formal name of the family and it includes those species. Uh, Prussian carp would fall under another name. Um, but yeah, I guess that sort of answers, I hope, uh, what you were thinking. Also, um, oh, sorry, Nick, go ahead. I just want to point out that uh, Prussian carp are not limited to ponds anymore. They are in the wild and they are sp spreading rapidly and they're spreading downstream. So they started upstream and now they're spreading downstream uh, throughout uh, the Southern Prairie provinces. Uh, they are, uh, very similar to goldfish, uh, and uh, and they're in the same same group of fishes as goldfish. Uh, they they appear to tolerate colder temperatures better than the goldfish that we're seeing even in the Great Lakes. So um, they are well suited to uh, the Canadian climate and and doing well, unfortunately, and then hence having significant impacts in the in the Canadian environment. Right now, um, their eastern spread, if, if it's natural without people moving them, would would end uh, in basically, um, you know, northwestern Ontario, which is part of the uh, the, the Winnipeg River drainage system. Uh, they could not get naturally get into the Great Lakes directly. Uh, but of course, there's always a concern when fish is spread like this that people move them, right? And um, for for whatever reason, uh, people move them. Uh, so uh, I think you know uh, Canadians should be concerned about Prussian carp and their impacts on the prairies. Uh, I don't think the the threat is imminent to the Great Lakes, but I can never rule out the potential stupidity of some people. And uh, sorry, if you don't mind if I uh, interject as well, you know, with the, the Ministry of Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources and Forestry, um, I hope I got that right, NDMNRF, um, you know, they, they did uh, come out with the Invasive Species Act, which, you know, in 2015 and then 2016 to receive royal assent. And that lists a number of species which are prohibited and restricted within Ontario. And currently Prussian carp are in the works of being added to that list um, as prohibited species. So, you know, as Nick mentioned, getting here naturally, probably unlikely. Um, they're going to have to hitch a ride with somebody, most likely intentionally. And, you know, there's going to be regulatory tools in place that will hopefully d deter those people from doing that, because if they are stopped with Prussian carb, you know, there, there will be uh, potential repercussions for those people. Sorry, and while we're on Prussian carp and goldfishes, I'll just add that several years ago we did do a genetic study of goldfishes in North America, where we, you know, we fingerprinted uh, goldfishes from across North America, including a lot from the Great Lakes Bas Basin, and none of them in the Great Lakes Basin themselves were, were Prussian carp. There, all of them were goldfish. So um, likelihood that they are not yet here. Is, is high. Yeah, and, and Brooke mentioned the Invasive Species Act, and there are some new species being added uh, to that, in addition to Prussian carp. Um, other ones that come to mind would be like tench. So definitely some uh, 
other high risk species coming towards the Great Lakes that we're, we're thinking about. Um, so the next question we have, and it might be our last unless any other ones come in in the meantime, but I do wanna be mindful of time that, and it is 8.30, but I will ask just one more. Um, are Asian carp hosts of any common diseases that could impact popular sport fish? Um, I'm not sure if Becky or Nick wants to take that one. Nick. Uh, well, uh, yes, uh, they, they are host for um, spring viremia of carp, uh, which could spread to common carp and, and spring but and other species and spring but viremia of carp um, has been a problem in the Great Lakes before, uh, but you know, uh, uh, new introductions of Asian carps could come with new strains of spring viremia of carp and other diseases uh, as well. And, and it really depends where they come from, right? If they, they may, you know, if they come from the wild in the US, they may bring a, a host of diseases that we don't even know they have that they may have picked up from native species in the US and they're bringing bringing into Canadian waters for the first time. Or if they come from a hatchery, there may be hatchery-based issues. Uh, so we, we know of spring viremia of carp and, and several other pathogens that we would call fellow travelers that may, may come along for the ride and then, then subsequently in, uh, have negative impacts on our, our native fishes as well. So we certainly should be concerned about that uh, as well. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so that is all of the time we have for questions, but I encourage you uh, to reach out if there's anything further that you'd like to ask, we can connect you with the appropriate person to answer your question. So with that, uh, thank you all so much for attending. I hope that you learned a lot and you enjoyed yourself. Um, please don't forget to fill out our survey. It's super helpful to us to hear what you have to say about the session in general. Um, there's a bunch of other questions on there that would be really useful if you could answer as well. And then also, if you're in the area, stop by the Lambton Heritage Museum tomorrow night um, at 7 p.m. to 8. It's just to come and go, pop by, say hello, check out some gear, and ask some questions. Um, you can find more information on our website, asiancarp.ca, under the info session section. That's where all the information is. So with that, um, have a good night, everyone, and thank you so much. And thank you to our panel. I really appreciate your time. Yeah. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Take care, everybody.